Ah, well, well, well. I'm back, and it's been, what, a week? Yeah, I think so. Well, I'm back, my audio's crisper than ever, and not in a genetically engineering way. So buckle your fuckles, because we're about to discuss at least half an hour's worth of true crime. And if you're new here, I do recommend going back to episode 1. Not only does it shamelessly give me more views, which I love because I'm addicted to numbers, it also gives you a fuck ton of more true crime videos to watch, and you can watch me desperately try not to mispronounce things while explaining horrific murders. Now without further ado, let's just get this shit. United Airlines Trip 23 on October 10th, 1933, United Airlines Trip 23, a Boeing 247 airliner operated by United Airlines and registered as NC-13304, crashed near Chesterton, Indiana, United States. The transcontinental flight carried three crew and four passengers and originated in Newark, New Jersey, with its final destination in Oakland, California, until it met its true final destination. It was headed to its next stop in Chicago when it exploded en route. All aboard died in the crash, unsurprisingly, and the crash itself was caused by an onboard explosive device. Eyewitnesses on the ground reported hearing an explosion shortly after 9 p.m. and seeing the aircraft in flames at an altitude of about 1,000 feet. A second explosion followed after the aircraft crashed. The crash scene was adjacent to a gravel road about five miles outside of Chesterton, centered in a wood area on the Jackson Township farm of James Smiley. United States Bureau of Investigation investigator Melvin Purvis said, Our investigation convinced me the tragedy resulted from an explosion somewhere in the region of the baggage compartment, which is unsurprising because the way that the wreck looked, everything in the front had been blown forward, everything in the back had been blown backward, and there was a big-ass hole punched in the side. Now, with the investigation, Dr. Carl Davis of the Porter County Coroner's Office and experts from the Crime Detection Laboratory at Northwestern University examined evidence from the crash and concluded that it was caused by a bomb with nitroglycerin as the probable explosive. One of the passengers was seen carrying a brown package onto the aircraft in Newark, but investigators found the package amidst the wreckage and ruled it out as a source of the explosion. Investigators also found a rifle in the wreckage, but they determined that a passenger carried it aboard his luggage as he was en route to shoot at Chicago's North Shore Gun Club. Isn't that insane how you used to be able to just take cool shit like that on a plane? If I wanted to roll up with a samurai sword on an airplane, I'd be arrested, but if this was the 1930s, there'd be no fucking problem with that. Now, back to the incident, no suspect was ever identified, and it remains unsolved. But it was the first proven act of air sabotage in the history of commercial aviation. Imagine that being your claim to fame, that you fucking died in the world's first plane bombing. Wouldn't that be, uh, weird? Jack the Stripper. This might just be the biggest shit post of a name I have seen in this series. Who the fuck named this case? Cause that is morbidly hilarious. Maybe I am a little bit twisted after spending all this time around true crime, but that's fucking vile. So Jack the Stripper is actually relating and named after the Hammersmith Nude Murders. It's the name of a series of murders in West London, England in 1964 and 1965. The victims were all prostitutes, the pearls of the world, and they were found undressed in or near the River Thames, leading to the press nickname, The Killer Jack the Stripper. A shitty reference to Jack the Ripper, but also referring to the fact that these police officers were seeing naked-ass prostitutes. Very classy, very tasteful. What you see on screen now is a artist rendition of that guy. And, you know, honestly, I'd probably have enough rage to kill some people too if I looked like that.
Now, the victims that we have are Elizabeth Fig on screen now. She was born March 24th, 1938, and died the 17th of June, 1959. The cause of death was asphyxiation due to manual strangulation. Fig was found dead at 5.10 a.m. on the 17th of June, 1959, by police officers. Her body was found on scrubland between Dan Mason Drive and the river's town path, approximately 200 yards west of the Barnes Bridge. Her dress was torn at the waist and opened to reveal her breast. Marks around her neck were consistent with strangulation. Fig's underwear and shoes were missing and no identification or personal possessions were found. A pathologist occurred that the death occurred at the time that I literally just told you. A post-mortem photograph of Fig's face distributed to the press was independently recognized by her roommate and her mother. Gwyneth Rees, who uh, does not have a photo, none of them do, because there's only two photos on Wikipedia relating to this case. Gwyneth Rees was born 6th of August 1941 in Barrie's Wales and disappeared the 29th of September 1963. She then died sometime in 1963 after September at the age of 22 in London. The body of Gwyneth Rees was found on the 8th of November 1963 at the Barnesborough Council Household Refuse Disposal Site. Why the fuck do British people name shit like that? On Townhead Road, Mortlake. The dump was situated 40 yards from the Thames Town Path and approximately one mile, 1.6 kilometers, from Duke's Meadows. Rees was naked except for a single stocking on her right leg, extending no further up than the ankle. She had accidentally been decapitated by a shovel when the workmen had been using to level the refuse. Jesus fucking Christ, that's grim. Hannah Talaford. Hannah Talaford was born the 19th of August, 1933, and disappeared in January 1964. She died the same year at the age of 30 in London, but this time she died in of drowning. Talaford was found dead on the 2nd of February, 1964, on the Thames foreshore below the London House Clubhouse of London Cornetham Sailing Club, west of Hammersmith Bridge. She had been strangled and then drowned, and several of her teeth were missing. Her underwear had been stuffed into her mouth. There's also Irene Charlotte Lockwood, similar case. Helen Bartholomew, similar case. And that's actually who's on screen, not the first person that I named, so my apologies for that, but I'm not restarting the recording. Mary Fleming, Francis Brown, Bridget O'Hara, and that does for all of the victims. They all died in the similar circumstances, they all were prostitutes, and they were all found naked, which I guess the media found funny. Chief Superintendent John Du Rose of Scotland Yard, the detective put in charge of the case, interviewed almost 7,000 suspects. In the spring of 1965, the investigation into the murders encountered a major breakthrough, when a sample of paint which perfectly matched that recovered from several of the victims' bodies was found beneath a concealed transformer at the rear of a building on the Heron Factory Estate in Acton. This factory estate faced a spray-painting shop. Shortly thereafter, DuRose held a news conference in which he falsely announced the police had narrowed down the suspect pool to down to 20 men, and that by a process of elimination, these suspects were being eliminated from the investigation. After a short time, he again announced that the suspect pool contained only 10 members, and then only three. There were no further known stripper killings following the initial news conference. According to the writer Anthony Summers, Hannah Talaford and Francis Brown, the strippers' third and seventh victims, were peripherally connected to the 1963 Profomo affair. Some victims were also known to engage in the underground party scene in addition to appearing in pornographic movies. Several writers have postulated that the victims may have known each other and that the killer may have been connected to this scene as well. There were several suspects, of course, but the case ultimately remains unsolved, which I can show you with the little spoilers that Wikipedia put in their photos. So that does it for this segment of the video. Oklahoma Girl Scout Murders Somewhere in May or April of 1977, 
counselors at Camp Scott, somewhere in Oklahoma, discovered a note in a tent that said, We are on a mission to kill three girls in Tent 1. The director of the camp session treated the note as a prank, and it was discarded. Around 7 p.m., Sunday, June 12th, 1977, the night before camp started, a thunderstorm hit the area, and the girls at the camp huddled in their tents. Among them were Lori Lee Farmer, aged 8, Doris Denise Milner, aged 10, and Michelle Heather Goose, aged 9. The girls were residents of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, a suburb of Tulsa. They were sharing tent number 8 in the camp's Kiowa unit, which was located the furthest known from the camp counselor's tent, and partially obscured by the showers for the camp. At around 6 a.m. June 13th, a camp counselor on her way to the girls' tent found a girl's body in her sleeping bag in the forest. It was soon discovered that all three girls in tent number eight had been killed. Their bodies left on a trail leading to the showers about 150 yards from their tent. Subsequent testing showed that they had been raped, bludgeoned, and strangled. A large red flashlight was found on top of the girls' bodies. A fingerprint was found on the lens, but has never been identified. A footprint from a 9.5 shoe size was also found in the blood in the tent. Between 2.30 and 3 a.m. on June 13th, a landowner heard quite a bit of traffic on a remote road near the camp, but that's all there was. In the aftermath, Camp Scott was evacuated and later shut down. There was a suspect, Jean Leroy Hart. He had been at large since 1973 after escaping from Mays County Jail. He had been kidnapped, convicted of kidnapping and raping two pregnant women, as well as four counts of first-degree burglary. Hart was raised about a mile from Camp Scott, and Hart, a Cherokee, was arrested within a year at the home of a Cherokee medicine man. He was represented by Garvin A. Isaacs, a local Oklahoma attorney. He was tried March 1979, although the local sheriff pronounced himself as 1,000% certain that Hart was guilty, a local jury acquitted him. As a convicted rapist and jail escapee, he still had 305 years of his 308-year sentence left to serve in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary, and on June 4th, 1979, Hart collapsed and died of a heart attack at age 35 ironic considering his name. He had this heart attack after about an hour of lifting weights and jogging in the prison exercise yard. Two of the families later sued the Magic Empire Council and its insurer for five million, alleging negligence allowed within the camp under Magic Empire. The civil trial included discussion of the threatening note and the fact that tent number eight was 86 yards from the counselor's tent. In 1985, by a 93 vote, jurors decided in favor of Magic Empire. In 1989, DNA testing was conducted that showed three of the five probes matched Hart's DNA. Statistically, DNA from one in one 7,700 Native Americans would obtain these results. In 2008, authorities conducted a new DNA testing on stains found on a pillowcase, the results of which proved inconclusive because the samples were too deteriorated to obtain a DNA profile. In 2017, 30,000 in donations were raised by the sheriff in order to do new DNA tests using the latest advances in testing. But nothing ever came of it. Richard Goose, the father of one of the three victims, went on to help the state legislature pass the Oklahoma Victims Bill of Rights. He also helped found the Oklahoma Crime Victims Compensation Board. Another parent, Sherry Farmer, founded the Oklahoma Chapter of Parents of Murdered Children, a support group. On May 16, 2003, when Mr. Another Pen was still in his mother's womb, three people died when a man shot them during a robbery at the small Blue Ridge Savings Bank off Highway 85 and State 14 in Greer. 
The deaths of two customers and a bank employee have remained one of the area's unresolved mysteries, despite an intensive FBI investigation. A feature on America's Most Wanted TV show and a posted reward for $100,000 have done nothing. A number of persons of interests, all of whom turned out to have airtight alibis, have been investigated in the years since the tragedy. The case has been featured in local newspapers several times. Some people think that the perpetrator, who is probably driving a stolen red Oldsmobile Alera, is dead. A man with a record of stolen cars and bank robberies killed himself when he was stopped by police in 2005. He used a Glock pistol, the kind used in the bank shootings. Ebb and Margaret Barnes died in the robbery. He was a retired physics professor at USC Spartanburg, and she worked for the National Beta Clubs there. Bank employee Sylvia Hotzclaw was also killed. Now, the original poster of the page on Reddit that I'm reading doesn't know if the absence of guards and plated glass is that uncommon. Where I live, guards are seen occasionally, but plated glass is very, you know, rare. The building, although being described as a trailer, is by no means a flimsy building. It's more of a modular home. And in the picture seen, you can see the building from multiple angles. The second picture that you're looking at now seems to have been taken the day of the murders. Greer, South Carolina is a small city, but it sits right between Greenville and Spartanburg, two decent sized cities. And right off the bank is I-85, which leads south to Atlanta and north to Charlotte. The killer could have easily scooted out of town and headed to a large city. The case remains unsolved, but often people wonder if the building's weak construction for a bank has contributed to what happened, because the bank was described as not being a bank at all, not yet. It was literally just a utility trader. Supposedly, it was not known there were no guards or plated glass, or really that although there was nearly a year, it was the temporary site and a real sitting duck. You won't see any reports to that, and no one, in regards to the case, had ever seen a prefabbed utility building used for a bank of any kind besides this. As I said, the case remains unsolved and likely will. Waverly Stranglings In the 1970s, three young women were found strangled in a small Iowa town. The small town of Waverly, Iowa, of about 10,000 people in the northeastern part of the state, is generally a very quiet and safe town. Most people who live there don't even know about the case, and there's very little information about it. But three women, Valerie Klosowowski, aged 14, Julie Benning, 18, and Maria Lisa Pink, 19, were all strangled to death over the course of just a decade. The murders are believed to be connected. Julie Benning was, of course, by far the most documented of the three murders. She worked at a strip club, not as a stripper, but as a waitress. But because of the simple association with being at a strip club, the religious idiots in the town seemed to act as though she had it coming. Six months later, when the next set of bodies were found, well, that's when police started to look into it a little bit. Now, however, these stranglings weren't linked for a while. The police had all the information they needed at the time and ignored it, simply because of the fact that, well, I don't know the fact, so I can't really say because of the fact, but it seems that all three of the women had some kind of connection to the strip club. Now, of course, nobody cares about strippers or hookers or all the proles of the world, so why would the police of such a place ever look? Why would the police ever care? The fact that I've had as hard a time as I had digging up information about this case is remarkable and terrifying because I'm not even halfway through the entirety of the iceberg, but I digress. People's lives are more important than an organization 
dedicated to cold cases. People's lives are more important than having to search online for information for an hour. But what does it matter at the end of the day, huh? The case happened 40 years ago. There's no suspect, and there never will be. On the next installment of disappointingly small Wikipedia pages, we have the Chicago Strangler. The Chicago Strangler is a nickname given to an American serial killer or potentially multiple killers suspected of raping and murdering at least 55 women and girls in southwestern Chicago between 2001 and 2021. The killings were combined only in 2018 and until then they were considered to have been committed by different perpetrators. Nevertheless, representatives of the Chicago Police Department told the media in 2019 that there actually might be several serial killers operating in the city. As victims, the criminals choose girls and women predominantly black between the ages of 18 and 58. Most of the victims were sex workers who had previous encounters with the justice system. Nearly all were strangled and abandoned in abandoned buildings, alleys, garbage bins, parks, and snowdrifts. In November 2007, one man killed two women in two days, placed their bodies in garbage cans, and then set them on fire. The majority of the mur murders were committed near Washington Park in Chicago's south side, a high crime area near Garfield Park in western Chicago, as well as the surrounding areas. Now that is rather disappointing. Now here's your unfun fact of the episode. Uh, there are at any given time between 20 to 50 active serial killers in the United States, so don't get caught slacking and hopefully the authorities can bring that sick fuck to justice soon. Uh, you know, I am a very angry person, so my solutions to these types of crimes are very angry. But I do genuinely believe that we should subject serial killers to a slow and brutal death. None of that quick, like, chemical shit. I'm talking, like, some gruesome shit. I-70 Strangler. Not to be confused with the I-70 Killer and any of the other I-70 sickos that I've discussed on this iceberg because there's been several and they're all really starting to blend together. The I-70 Strangler is a nickname of an unidentified American serial killer who killed 12 gay men, a tragic loss for the world. Genuinely, gay men be so fine. In Indiana and Ohio between June 1980 and October 1991, dumping their bodies near Interstate 70. Though officially unsolved, it's believed that deceased serial killer, spoiler alert, I'm not gonna fucking tell you this soon, might have been the perpetrator. Now, the killer would choose young boys and adolescents as victims who he met in popular gay bars and other similar establishments within a four-block radius of Indianapolis. All of the victims were later found naked or partially clothed near the I-70, often dumped in rivers, streams, and ditches in the rural countryside. Each had been, you'll never fucking guess it by the name, strangled to death. In total, 12 men were recorded as his official victims. Michael Petrie, Maurice Taylor, Devloyd, Delvoid, Lee Baker, Michael Andrew Riley, Eric Allen Rotger, Michael Allen Glenn, Allen's a really popular middle name, James Robbins, Jean Paul Talbot, Stephen L. Elliott, Clay Russell Boatman, Thomas Clevenger Jr., and Otto Gary Becker. All of these people had various injuries, but were ultimately strangled to death, and all of them were no older than 30. A task force of eight police officers was created by Indianapolis police in 1982 to investigate the crimes, following the discovery of Riley's body in June 1983. Four more men were included in the list of potential victims, 25-year-old Gary Davis, 27-year-old Dennis Brodsky, 21-year-old John Roach, and 22-year-old Daniel McNeve. Like the other victims, they were all homosexual, visited gay bars, the cool ones, and were killed in Indianapolis between August 1981 and May 1983. In 1983, the FBI joined the investigation because, as we all know, those put on cops don't know shit. 
with profilers suggesting that the offender showed volatile behavior when committing the murders. Near the end, it was determined that there were at least two differing perpetrators operating independently of one another, and because of this, Davis, Brodsky, and Roach, and McNeve were removed from the list. Some other gay-hating homosexual serial killer was killing those guys. According to the FBI, Davis, Brodsky, Roach, and McNeve's killer was a white man, you'll never have fucking believed that, between the ages of 20 and 30. Worked a job requiring low-skill labor, was a fan of military paraphernalia, and led a healthy lifestyle. In his everyday life, he expressed homophobic views, but was secretly a raging homosexual who committed the murders out of shame and self-hatred. The other victims, according to investigators, were killed by, you'll never believe it, a white man, about 45 years of age, likely overweight, but had a high-paying job and was well-respected in his community, meaning that men would pity-fuck him. They also concluded that the killer may be married, but has no intimate relationship with his wife, because, <laughs> my marriage is broken, am I right? Now, of course, in addition to the fact that he liked young boys, the second killer, that is, he likely felt shame and guilt in that, in addition to possibly destroying his career and reputation, it would result in deep hatred, which led him to kill. Of the first suspects was 47-year-old Duncan Patterson, a Florida native. In the fall of 1982, he was arrested in Indianapolis on charges of statutory rape against young boys. Oh, joy. And shortly after his arrest, a friend of... How the fuck do you even say that? Mr. Baker claimed to be that the former had gotten into Patterson's van. I see he's got the Chomo van. We all know where this goes. Patterson later admitted that it was true. He did have a Chomo van and that he had paid Baker $20 for oral sex, which the two had in a hotel room. He denied killing the boy, however, claiming he had taken Baker after the sex to the Indianapolis Central Library, where he let him go and saw him enter another Chomo van. Patterson's testimony was corroborated by a witness who had seen Baker leave the van, go up the library steps, talk to a man he apparently knew, before the two got into the older man's car. To assess his credibility, Patterson was asked to undergo a polygraph test, which, as you should know by now, does literally fuck all, pissing on a piece of paper and telling you that Jesus Christ will return 82 years in the past is more effective than a polygraph test. But he agreed to the polygraph test and successfully passed. While he was convicted of charges of child molestation, he was officially excluded as a suspect, which, hey, you know, that's, that's a win at the end of the day. You fucked kids, mister, but you sure didn't be a serial killer. They're equally as bad, but on Wikipedia, you're just the kid fucker. In 1983, a resident of Camel, August Gus Kaito, was briefly detained and interrogated for the murders in Indianapolis, but was quickly released after investigators found no evidence linking him to any of the crimes. Another, more viable suspect was a convicted serial killer. Wow, that's viable. Larry Eiler, who was found guilty of murdering 21 adolescents and young men in Indiana and Illinois, and was currently on death row for the 1986 murder of 16-year-old Daniel Briggs. However, there was inconsistencies in the modus operandi of Eiler and that of the I-70 Strangler. Eiler's killings occurred over a year, and he killed his victims with a knife, while the I-70 Strangler's victims were strangled over a period of 11 years. Nevertheless, both killers targeted homosexuals and dumped their bodies near interstate highways. Now, let me take a moment to talk about the wording in Wikipedia articles. As an author, the words that you choose are incredibly important. And while homosexual sounds good, it is a relatively dehumanizing term. So while it fits for the informational tone of this, gay people would have worked. Gay men would have worked because the victims were human. And it's easy to forget about that and that slog of information that is just being fucking thrown at you. But I'm not going to talk about this guy anymore because... Let me tell you who it probably really was. Herb Baumeister. In February 1998, an Indianapolis resident contacted the police and claimed a local businessman, Herb Baumeister, was a mysterious man photographed leaving the Vogue Theater with one of the I-70 Strangler's victims, Michael Riley. 
Prior to his suicide in 1996, Baumeister was a prime suspect in the murders of at least seven men who were killed between 1993 and 1995 in Indianapolis, whose remains were later found buried on his property. Rule number one of being a serial killer, don't shit where you fucking eat. If you go there, don't leave bodies there, and maybe don't kill people there. But then again, uh, it seems that a lot of serial killers that get caught slacking are stupid as shit. After this information surfaced, Baumeister was named the prime suspect in the I-70 Strangler case. According to investigators, he stopped dumping the bodies of his victims in 1991 after he bought the Fox Hollow Farm, which he would use as a burial site. As of 2021, no physical evidence has linked Baumeister and the I-70 Strangler victims, but we've all got a gut feeling. Ted Fleischaker, editor-in-chief for a gay newspaper, has claimed that Baumeister wasn't responsible for the killings and accused police officials of police misconduct, saying they used him as a convenient excuse to close the cases ahead of a municipal election, while the real killers remain at large. And that would also fit, too, because uh, police don't give a shit about you. You know what they give a shit about? Money. Juarez Ripper. I just want to take a moment to highlight the fact that the first thing that comes up when you type in Juarez Ripper is Criminal Minds Wiki. Lonely Women. Why have you done this? Shit, not even Lonely Women. I watched Criminal Minds too when I was lonely as fuck. Lonely Hominid Sentient Beings. Why? Anyway, let's get into the meat and fucking tendies of this. So up first on the dinner plate, we have Alejandro Menez, if my computer will load. There we go, thank you. Alejandro Menez, born Armando Martinez, is a Mexican serial killer and fugitive, along with Ana Benavides and Melchor Menez. He killed at least two women in Ciudad Juarez, but he is believed to be responsible for victi victims in all. His murders are organized and motivated by sexual compulsion and committed as part of a group. Alejandro was an orphan. He was baptized Armando Martinez, which means he still gets to go to heaven, because it was Alejandro who committed the crimes. He spent a portion of his childhood in orphanages in the United States. And during the 70s, he was adopted by Guillermo Menez, a Chihuahua business entrepreneur and owner of approximately 20 bars and nightclubs in Juarez. His family, who gave him his surname and changed his name to Alejandro. During the 1980s and 90s, Alejandro Melkor Cousins, they were, joined a gang of drug and jewelry traffickers that smuggled contraband into the U.S. Supposedly, they were under the protection of the Chihuahuan government headed by Francisco Barrio. In 1999, two former police officers, Victor Valuenza and Ramiro Romero Gomez, of the state and federal police started a new department specializing in femicides, accusing Alejandro and Menez of the deaths of several women categorized under the Juarez Ripper. Of course, according to Valenzuela and Romero, Menez had enjoyed the protection of the police in his crimes. That year, Valuenza was incarcerated on charges of narcotics sales and Romero was ex executed. Holy fucking shit. Earlier in 1995, Abdul Latif Sharif was arrested and faced charges for tens of femicides. He claimed to be innocent and accused Menez of being the true Juarez Ripper. The Menez cousins had begun their career as serial killers in 1988 alongside their activities as traffickers, but at some point they separated and began to kill in turns. In 1998, Alejandro Men Ana Benavides, who was working as a waitress at one of his family's bars. Menez's known victims were also were employed in family businesses. Instead of becoming a victim, however, it turned out Ana and he shared certain proclivities. Ana was a devil-worshipping fanatic who had already claimed the lives of three people, and she quickly began to take an active part in Menez's murders. In 1995, a book was unveiled by an unknown author using the pseudonym Richie, really Hispanic name there. The book painstakingly compiled the event of dozens of murders and all of the details involved with them. It's thought that Alejandro is the author of this book, and according to the manuscript, many of the women who were murdered in Juarez were killed during orgies arranged by members of organized crime, and they used the murders for snuff films. Wow. 
That hit me like a bag of bricks. Now let's go ahead and look at the other guy who has a Wikipedia page twice the size, and size is what counts, don't you know? Abdul Latif Sharif was born in a Muslim family in Egypt as an only child. Growing up, he suffered constant sexual abuse from his father and several male relatives. Although his father was opposed to him attending school because we can't have our son being smart, no sir, Sharif showed signs of above-average intelligence, spending his time training carrier pigeons and fishing in the river. At age 12, at his father's behest, he agreed to marry his 10-year-old cousin. But three years later, Sharif abandoned that promise to instead travel to the United States. His family disapproved, and his aunt allegedly cast a black magic spell upon him for not marrying her daughter. Don't you know, according to Jimi Hendrix, that one guy that everyone uh, really likes, incest is the best. You know, I still can't comprehend that he wrote that. I haven't accepted it yet. Anyway, back to the case. In Egypt, Sharif studied chemical engineering at Cairo University, where he achieved an average of 9.9. .9. Working as a high school and a university instructor, he spent some time in the Soviet Union before traveling to New York to find work in cosmetics, paint, and skincare companies. He was considered to be professional, attractive, and successful. Women became his obsession during his 21-year stay in the United States, and he married twice and would have five other partners with whom he lived with for long periods. Now, I could talk more about that, but I'm not going to. Imputation for sexual abuse. According to official accounts, Sharif was a promiscuous alcoholic and pedophile. He allegedly tortured dying animals during his hunting expedition and collected girls' clothes. According to other sources, this characterization of Sharif was an invention of the prosecution to make credible accusations against him. Sharif's first alleged assault took place on the 2nd of May 1981 in North Palm Beach, Florida, where he tricked a woman by promising her a job as a housekeeper. He then kidnapped the woman, beat her, sexually assaulted her, and then later let the woman go. The woman claiming that he had said, Oh, did I hurt you? I think you should go to a hospital. That's definitely something someone would say. Sharif's defense was provided by Sarakoa Inc., and though Sharif argued that the sex was consensual, he was convicted of charges of assault, rape, and illegal deprivation of liberty, and was released on parole. Almost immediately after leaving prison in August 1981, he assaulted another woman. Real smart fucking move for a supposed genius. On this occasion, he was sentenced to 45 days in prison after a defense once again financed by Sarakoa Inc., Curiously, Sharif was not dismissed until 1982. Now, however, at this point, Sharif's, Sharif's first alleged murder occurred in Mexico March 1995, but there were indications that he was a scapegoat of the Chihuahua Attorney General's office who made him into a serial killer. It was claimed that he could not have begun killing from 1978 to 1981 when the Juarez Ripper began being active because he was still in fucking Pennsylvania. When the unresolved disappearances of several women and girls occurred, however, Sharif was never connected to these events. Upon his arrival in Mexico in 1994, years after the Juarez Ripper cases had started, Sharif settled into the luxurious and exclusive Riconadas de San Marcos neighborhood in Ciudad Juarez, with all expenses sponsored by the company he worked for. Very nice. Sharif distinguished himself as an intelligent man and only part-time pedophili pedophiliac, patenting 25 chemical formulas. It was here that his prolific career as a serial killer allegedly lasted from 1994 to 1995. But again, how could he have been the Juarez Ripper when the Juarez Ripper was active earlier? He was, of course, convicted eventually, but it's likely seen as a fact that he was a scapegoat. And Sharif died in 2006 at the age of 59 in the Social Rehabilitation Center of Chihuahua, a really nice place to say prison. Lava Lake Murders the Lava Lake Murders refers to a triple murder that occurred near Little Lava Lake in Central Oregon in January of 1924. I've recommended this channel before and will recommend it again. Bedtime Stories has a fantastic episode about this that goes into much more interesting detail than I will. 
Edward Nichols, Rory Wilson, and Dewey Morris, residents of Bend, had made plans to spend the winter of 1923 to 1924 in a log cabin owned by a local logging contractor, Edward Logan, to work as fur trappers in the wilderness. The men moved into the cabin in the fall of 1923, the week before Christmas. Crazy how the week before Christmas is still technically fall, but I digress. Nichols visited Bend, reportedly in a jovial mood, and sold a sled full of expensive furs. He told the locals that the fur trapping had been going well. After Christmas, Alan Wilcoxon, a resort owner traveling by snowshoe from his home in Fall River to his resort at Elk Lake on route, stopped at Logan's cabin to visit the three men. Wilcoxon arrived January 15, 1924, and spent the evening there. According to him, all three of the men were in good spirits and had been successful in their trapping. On the morning of January 16th, he departed the cabin for Elk Lake. This was the last known sighting of the three men. Having no correspondence with any of the three men since December 1923 and having noticed that mink traps in the area had been left unmaintained, Having no correspondence with any of the three men since December 1923 and having noticed that mink traps in the area had been left unmaintained, Ennis Owen Morris, a brother of Dewey Morris and Pearl Linz, superintendent of the Tumalo Fish Hatchery, became suspicious. In April 1924, a search team traveled to the cabin but found no sign of the men. Inside the cabin, burnt food was in the pots on the stove, and the dining table had been set for a meal. Outside, the sled used for the transport of goods and equipment was missing, and a fox pen behind the cabin that contained five valuable foxes owned by Logan was empty. Upon searching inside, a blood-stained claw hammer was found in the corner of this pen. The search team checked on the men's tramping lines and discovered the frozen remains of 12 marten, 4 foxes, and 1 skunk, suggesting their traps in the surrounding forest had been left completely undetended. The following day in Deschutes County, Sheriff Clarence A. Adams arrived to begin the investigation near the shore of Big Lava Lake. The searchers found the men's large sled, which was marked with dark stains that were later confirmed to be blood. On the edge of the lake, a depression in the ice was detected where a hole had been visibly cut and frozen over. Nearby in a trail leading to the lake, a searcher discovered pools of blood in the thawing snow, as well as clumps of hair and a human tooth. Coating of ice on the lake, having thought enough that the searchers could explore by boat, Innes Morris and Adams discovered the bodies of the three men which had floated to the surface. Autopsies revealed that all three had died of gunshot wounds and blunt force trauma, likely from a hammer. Chekhov's gun there. Wilson had been shot in the right shoulder and the back of the head, while Nicole's jawbone had been shattered by a shotgun blast. He also had a bullet hole, likely from a revolver, in his head. Dewey Morris had been shot in the left forearm and also had a skull fracture, presumably from the hammer. It was estimated that the murders occurred in late December 1923 or early January 1924. In an official police report, Sheriff Claude McCauley wrote of the scene, even though the weather was perfect, the air, clear air was impregnated with the odor of death and decomposition, and it was with an undefinable spirit of awe and consternation that, that the little party had of hardy outdoorsmen laid aside their packs, kicked off their snowshoes, and prepared to tackle a grim job which was little to their liking. According to a published report in 1924, Police believed that at least two of the men had not been murdered in close vicinity to the cabin, but had been leered away from it. Initially, police suspecting a woodsman and moonshiner named Indian Erickson of the crimes who maintained a camp at nearby Coltis Lake. Erickson was dismissed by police, however, after... After, according to a... What? Wow, the Wikipedia article does not make sense here. After... After supplying an alibi, there we go, I had a mild stroke. It's okay, Lance Lasses and Lanbys. Logan provided police with a potential suspect shortly after the men's bodies were discovered, a fellow trapper named Lee Collins, who had at one time quarreled with the men over a purportedly stolen wallet. 
Collins had reportedly threatened to come back and kill Nichols, and he was discovered in actuality to be a man named Charles Kimsey, who had been arrested in 1923 for robbery and attempted murder in Bend, in which he threw W.O. Harrison, a stagecoach driver, down a well. Harrison survived, but Kimsey fled before the case went to trial. A traffic officer in Portland, Oregon, recognized Kimsey as a man who had approached him on January 24, 1924, carrying a gunny sack and asking for directions to a fur dealer in the city. The officer directed him to the Sumatra Fur Company on 3rd Street in northwest Portland, where the man sold his sack of furs for $110. Police issued a $1,500 reward for Kimsey's arrest and conviction in connection to the murders, but the case went cold. Nine years after the case had gone cold, Kimsey was spotted in Kalispell, Montana, and was apprehended by police and returned to Oregon for questioning in the murders. Though the police had a circumstantial case against Kimsey, the fur dealer who had purchased the furs in January of 1924 could not positively identify the man as Kimsey. Kimsey was charged, however, in the 1923 attempted murder of Harrison and sentenced to life imprisonment in Oregon State Penitentiary. In spite of circumstantial evidence suggesting Kimsey's involvement in the murder, the case remains unsolved. Stone Man The Stone Man is a name given by the popular English-language print media of Calcutta, India, to an unidentified serial killer who murdered at least 13 homeless people in their sleep in 1989. The name is also given to the perpetrator of a similar series of murders in Bombay from 1985 to 1988. It has been speculated that these were the work of the same person who could have been responsible for as many as 26 murders. The Stone Man was blamed for 13 murders over six months, the first in June 1983 but it was never established whether the crimes were committed by one person or a group. The Calcutta police also resolve, failed to resolve whether any of the crimes were committed by copycat murders, and to date no one has been charged with any of the crimes. All 13 cases remain unsolved. The first hint of a serial killer who was targeting homeless rag pickers and beggars in India came from Bombay, starting in 1985 and lasting well over two years. A series of 12 murders were committed in the Scion and King Circle locality of the city. The criminal's modus operandi was simple. First, they would find an unsuspecting victim sleeping alone in a desolate area. The victim's head was then crushed with a single stone weighing as much as 30 kilograms. In most cases, a victim's identities cannot be ascertained, because they slept alone, did not have relatives or associates who could identify them, and now had a crushed skull. Compounded to this was the fact that the victims were people of very simple means and the individual crimes were not high profile. A homeless waiter survived one of the stone man's attacks and managed to escape and report it to the police. However, in the dimly lit area of Sion where he was sleeping, he wasn't able to get a good look at him. Shortly afterwards, in 1987, a rag picker was hacked to death in the adjoining suburb of Mataguna. Even though police and the media suspected it was a stone man killer, no evidence linking the incidents was ever found. In the middle of 1988, the killing suddenly stopped. The case remains unsolved. Whether or not the Bombay killings were linked to the Calcutta stone man killings has never been confirmed. However, the similarity of the instrument choice of victims, execution, and the time of attack suggests the assailants was familiar with the Bombay episodes, if not the killer himself. The first victim in Calcutta died from injuries to the head in June 1989. Twelve more murders attributed to the stone man were reported within the following six months. All of the murdered were homeless pavement dwellers who slept alone in dimly lit areas of the city. Most of the murders took place in central Calcutta, adjoining the Howrah Bridge. Because the murder killed his victims by dropping a heavy stone or concrete slab, the police assumed the assailant was probably a tall, well-bent male. However, in the absence of any eyewitness description, no confirmed physical description ever became available. Similar incidents were reported in Guwahiri, city of Assam, during February 2009. And there were films based around the events that were, eh, okay-ish. But that is about all that there is about the Stone Man. This is a strangely simple but 
catchy name for a serial killer, so good job to India. Much better than Jack the Stripper. The Stolero Yakmanchaka's affair in Hebrew, seen right here. I can't pronounce that, I'm not going to try, which is sad because I'm Jewish by descent, so. Refers to a series of three unsolved murders that took place in Israel in the early 1960s. The murders, which were never solved, aroused a great deal of public interest, and due to similarities between them, they are widely speculated to have been the work of a serial killer or Soviet intelligence. Between November 1962 and July 1963, three murders took place in central Israel. The victims were not connected, but each case showed similar parallels. In each murder, the killer, who had no apparent motive, gunned down the victims with an Uzi submachine gun, and then immediately fled the scene and was not caught. The first victim was Moshi Stolero, and you can see the murder scene of him right here. Moshi Stolero was a 32-year-old disabled man who owned a household goods, book, and newspaper store in Ramat Gan, and lived with his parents in an apartment on Hachayal Street, in the same building where his store was located. On November 15, 1962, at around 7 p.m., after Stolero had closed and locked up his shop and was returning home, a gunman fired at him with an Uzi as he was in the stairwell of a building. Stolero was hit three times and killed. The fact that the murder was not committed as part of a robbery and attempt and nothing was stolen from his store led the police to conclude that the murder's sole intention was to kill Stolero. Shumuel Yakman. The second victim was Dr. Shumuel Yakman, an internal physician in Tel Aviv who provided medical services to the U.S. Embassy in Israel. Dr. Yakman, who was born in Germany as Siegfried Yakman, lived at 12 May Street. He was murdered the night of April 12th. Yakman said his wife, Sarah, and him were returning from a concert. This is not said by him. I stuttered there. My bad. When at the entrance of their home, he was killed by a single shot to the neck from an Uzi. The killer immediately fled without leaving a trace. Deborah Chakas The third victim was Deborah Chakas, who lived with her family in a small house near an orchard on the outskirts of Kafar Saba. On the early morning hours of July 17, 1963, a man entered their home and fired several shots from an Uzi at Deborah and her husband, Fischel, as they slept. Deborah was killed and Fischel was seriously injured. The murderer again escaped. The fact that three mysterious murders had taken place within nine months, all without apparent motive carried out with the same type of weapon, and in which the murders managed to escape without leaving a trace, caused panic amongst the public as the media struggled to find an explanation. Due to the fact that Deborah Chekhez had visited the Soviet Union to see her sick mother two years before, and Dr. Yachman provided services to the U.S. Embassy, conspiracy theories about Soviet involvement and Soviet intelligence were proposed. At around the same time, a 19-year-old medical student at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem named Levi Newfield left his home and disappeared without a trace. Newfield had survived the Holocaust as a toddler together with his brother Yehuda, and the two brothers had been adopted by a couple from Ramat Gan. Newfield was an outstanding student, but as his final exams approached, he began to suffer from mental problems prior to his disappearance. After he had been gone for two weeks, his family reported him missing to police, and then police decided there was a high probability that Newfield had committed the murders. A nationwide manhunt was launched in which over 10,000 police officers were involved. He was present, presented to the public as a dangerous person, and it was suspected that psychological damage brought on by the trauma of the Holocaust had driven him to kill. The press accused him of the murders, which led to the poetess Zelda sending a letter of protest to Haritz, accusing the press of baselessly accusing him without a trial, and comparing the media frenzy to a lynch mob, which would sound about right. On May 3rd, 1964, Newfield was found dead by a group of youths in an abandoned building in the Ein Kirim neighborhood of Jerusalem. A suicide note and a bottle of poison were found next to his body, and a pathological examination of his body had found that the time of death preceded two of the three murders. It was speculated at the time that the murders may have been linked to Soviet involvement due to Chakyaz's previous visit to the Soviet Union and Yakman's services to the U.S. 
Although, there's no explanation for why the Soviets would have wanted to kill Stolero. In October 2012, Avraham Chakez, the son of Deborah, was interviewed by the Israeli newspaper Yadit Unhoreth. I'm not, I'm so sorry. I can't say that, and claimed that his father Fischel had been active in organizing the escape of Soviet Jews who wanted to leave the country, and continued working for Israeli intelligence after his arrival in Israel. He speculated that his mother had been followed after her visit to the Soviet Union, and claimed that his father was a killer's actual target. Avraham claimed to have spoken with Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion himself over the matter, and it said that Ben-Gurion had told him the killer was a Soviet agent who had since left the country. Iser Harold, the former dictator, director general, wow, that was a bad stutter, of the Mossad, denied the killer was a Soviet spy. Wall Street bombing, 1920. The lunch rush was just beginning as a nondescript man driving a cart pressed an old horse forward on a mid-September day in 1920. He stopped the animal in its heavy load in front of the USSA office just across from the J.P. Morgan building at the heart of Wall Street. The driver got down and quickly disappeared into the crowd. Within minutes, the cart exploded into a hail of metal fragments, immediately killing more than 30 people and injuring some 300. The carnage was horrific, and the death toll rose throughout the day as more victims succumbed to their wounds. The only question was who was responsible and why. In the beginning, it wasn't obvious that the explosion was an intentional act of terrorism. Crews cleaned up the damage overnight, including physical evidence today that would be crucial to identifying the perpetrator. But by the next morning, Wall Street was back in business because money never stops, baby. Broken windows were draping canvases, workers in bandages but functioning nonetheless, because we don't care about your soul, we care about the money. Wall Street, baby. Conspiracy theories abounded, but the New York Police and Fire Departments and the Brio of Investigation, the FBI's predecessor, as well as U.S. Secret Service were on the job actively pursuing leads. The Brio interviewed hundreds of people who had been around the area before, during, and after the attack, but developed almost no information of value. The few recollections of the driver and wagon were vague and virtually useless. The NYPD was able to reconstruct the bomb and its fuse mechanism, but there was much debate about the nature of the explosive, and all the potential components were commonly available. The most promising lead had actually come prior to the explosion. A letter carrier had found four crudely spelled and printed flyers in the area from a group calling itself the American Anarchist Fighters that demanded the release of political prisoners. The letters, discovered later, seemed similar to ones used the previous year in two bombing campaigns fomented by Italian anarchists. The Brio worked diligently investigating up and down the East Coast to the trace of printing these flyers without success. Based on the bomb attacks over the previous decade, the Brio initially suspected followers of the Italian anarchist group Luigi Gandolini. But the case couldn't be proved, and the anarchist who they followed had fled the country. Over the next three years, hot leads turned cold and promising trails turned to dead ends because this was the 1920s. If you think cops are dumb as fuck now, they were even stupider then. The bombers were not identified, and the best evidence and analysis since that fateful day of September 16, 1920 suggests that the Brio's initial thought was correct, that a small group of Italian anarchists were remained. But the mystery remains. For the young Brio, the bombing became one of their earliest terrorism cases, but uh, by far the last, especially in New York. Uh, can I get a little 2001 reference in there? Just... As the decades pass, the threat from terrorism would, of course, keep going, which would allow America to create pointless wars about it and kill innocent little brown kids. Yeehaw, capitalism, baby. Now, this Wall Street bombing happened over a hundred years ago, and everyone knows what the saying is, history repeats itself, right? Well, it is the 20s now, so, uh, when's Wall Street bombing 2 Electric Boogaloo coming out? Burger Chef Murders. 
The Burger Chef murders began at a Burger Chef restaurant in Speedway, Indiana, on the night of Friday, November 17, 1978. Four young employees went missing in what was initially thought to be a petty theft of cash from the restaurant safe. By Saturday morning, it became a clear case of robbery and kidnapping, and by Sunday, when their bodies were discovered, a case of murder. Investigators believe they have identified some or all of the perpetrators without physical evidence they have not been able to prosecute those who remain alive. At some point between 11 p.m. closing time and midnight on November 17, 1978, four employees of Burger Chef Restaurant in Speedway, Indiana at 5725 Crodsfordville Road if you guys want to drop down and give it a visit. I've never had Burger Chef, so I have no clue whether or not to recommend it. All these employees disappeared. Assistant Manager Jane Freet, 20. Daniel Davis, 16. Mark Flemons, 16. Ruth Ellen Shelton, 18. A fellow employee who came by at midnight to visit the four noticed that the restaurant was empty. The money safe was open and the back door was ajar. Police found two empty currency bags and an empty roll of adhesive tape next to the open safe. Initially, police didn't consider the case to be serious, given that management had reported the loss of approximately $581, or $2,000 and some change in 2020's money, from the safe. There were no clear signs of a struggle, and it was not the case to be one of petty embezzlement, with the assumption that the pilfered cash had been used by the youths to go partying that night. More than $100 was left in the register. Although the purses and jackets of the missing women had been left at the shop, the petty theft theories initially seemed the most likely, and the scene was cleaned by employees early Saturday morning. Buddy Elwanger, a Speedway police officer who's eventually signed the case, admitted, We screwed it up from the beginning. Good job, buddy. You got it right. Cops always screw it up from the beginning. Why would people going to a party leave their purse at home? It's common fucking sense. Not only was a restaurant cleaned and allowed to be reopened, but no photographs were taken beforehand, effectively eliminating any potential evidence from the crime scene. Wow, you guys really fucked the dog here, didn't you? When the four did not show up Saturday morning and Fritz Vega was found partially locked in town, concerns grew. It became evident they had not been abducted while closing the restaurant for the night, with the attack possibly beginning as they removed trash bags out the back door. On Sunday afternoon, hikers found the bodies of the four over 20 miles away in the rural woods of Johnson County. Both Davis and Sheldon have been shot execution style numerous times with the 38 caliber firearm. Freed had been stabbed twice in the chest. The handle of the knife had broken off and was missing. The blade was later recovered from her corpse. Flemons was later determined to have been bludgeoned, possibly with a chain, and had died from choking to death on his own blood. All four victims were still wearing their Burger Chef uniforms. Gotta die in that corporate drip, right? Money and watches were found on the dead victims, implying robbery might not have been the sole motive for the murders. The leading theory has been the four victims were kidnapped during a botched robbery, possibly after one of the victims recognized one of the perpetrators. Flemons was covering for another employee's shift and was not scheduled to work that night, leading investigators to speculate perhaps he was the one who had recognized the killers, since they had not planned on him being there. On the night of the murders, a 16-year-old eyewitness saw two suspicious men in a car outside Burger Chef just before closing. Both men were white and in their 30s, so that's 60% of America. One man had a beard, and the other was clean-shaven with light-colored fair hair. The police had models of suspects created in clay to assist the investigation. Later that year, a man in a bar in Greenwood bragged that he had been involved in the killings, and police subsequently leaped down his asshole, but he passed a polygraph claiming to have not been involved, and officers were now unable to bring charges on other grounds. Again, I've said it before, and I will say it again, and I will say it a million more times. I could piss on tree bark and tell you that Jesus Christ will return 80 years in the past, and that would be more truthful than 99% of polygraph tests. Anyway, the man provided the names of others who he suggested belonged to a fast food robbery gang, 
because that's something that's really profitable, I guess, and whom investigators suspected may have been involved in the case. While following up on these leads in Franklin, officers spotted a man who bore a strong resemblance to the bearded man composite. Summoned for a lineup, the man shaved his beard, which he had for previous five years. The night before he was to appear, a neighbor of his who had not been spotted by the original witness, but who had been named by Greenwood a suspect, subsequently went to prison for strong-arm robberies committed with a shotgun. Another associate named by the Greenwood police officer a suspect, who fit the description of the fair-haired man, was also subsequently imprisoned for the other armed robberies of fast food chain restaurants. However, without confessions, despite offers of plea deals to any suspects and not directly responsible for the killings, and without direct physical evidence of the involvement, they were not able to effect an arrest and a charge. At the time, there was some speculation that the murders were tied to other crimes that had shocked the town over preceding months, such as the murder of Julia Cyphers and the Speedway bombings. At the time, the perpetrator of the bombings was still on the loose, however, these cases were subsequently found to be unconnected to the November murders. Investigators continue to follow leads relating to possible suspects as widely as Cincinnati, Milwaukee, Chicago, and Dallas. However, they were not able to find any more promising leads or to locate the evidence they believed would have been the most useful, the firearm, the handle of the knife, and the chain used in the murders, nor have any perpetrators made confessions to police, though the son of the bearded suspect has told police that he confided in him that he had been involved prior to his death. Ken York, one of the original investigators on the case, has noted that the details of the Greenwood suspect and the bearded suspect, from an apparent suicide and heart attack respectively their deaths were, came suspiciously close after the release of the armed robber named by the suspect from the Greenwood bar. In 1981, Freed's brother James was investigated for involvement in the murders after being arrested for unrelated drug charges, because obviously if you smoke a little pot and co do a little cocaine, you clearly killed your fucking sister, you dumb sociopath. But he was cleared of involvement in less than a week. In 1984, Detective Mel Wilsey of the Marion County Sheriff's Department received a call from an inmate at the Pendleton Correctional Facility by someone named Donald Forrester, who was serving a 95-year prison sentence for rape. Forrester said he was involved with the murders and was willing to confess in order to avoid his scheduled transfer to the notoriously violent Indiana State Prison. At first, the call seemed promising, as Forrester was a career criminal who was living in Speedway when the murders take place, and was not incarcerated at the time. Wilsey got a court order to bring Forrester to Marion County, where he confessed to shooting Davis and Shelton. He then led police to the crime scene in the woods, where he accurately described the location and position of the dead bodies when they were found. He also knew about the broken handle of the knife, which was not widely publicized. According to Forrester, Freed's brother James owed money on a drug deal, so he and three other associates had gone to the restaurant to threaten her. But when Flemons intervened to protect Freed, a fight broke out outside Burger Shift, during which Flemons fell and hit his head on the bumper of a car. Believing Flemons was dead or dying, Forrester and his accomplices decided to abduct and kill all the employees to eliminate all the witnesses to their crime. Forrester said he shot Davison Sheldon and gave the names of the three men he claimed were responsible for killing Flemons and Freet. He then led the police to a spot where he claimed he had thrown the gun into a river. However, a thorough search of the river did not find any weapon. Next, Wilsey interviewed Forrester's ex-wife, who said that days after the murders, Forrester had driven out with her to a wooded area, where he left her in the car and got out to retrieve several firearm shell casings off the ground. He had then driven back home and flushed the casings down the toilet because fuck your pipelines, I guess. Wilsey then got a warrant to search a septic tank of the house, which was now owned by someone else. The search turned up several spent 38 caliber shell casings. Now, however, after someone within the sheriff's office leaked details of Forrester's cooperation, he suddenly recanted his confession, claiming it was coerced. With no further cooperation in Forrester and no direct evidence proving he committed the crime, Forrester was never charged. He died in prison from cancer in 2006 at the age of 55, but he should have died much earlier, sack of shit. 
Despite thousands of hours of police investigation as well as Burgerchef offering a reward of $25,000 to anyone who could capture the murders or provide information about their whereabouts, the attackers were never prosecuted and the case remains officially unsolved. Indiana State Police continue to hold the case open, having reportedly investigated everything that they could, and even used DNA tracing techniques developed since the initial investigations. There are plaques honoring the various victims, but plaques don't bring people back to the, from the dead. Atlanta's Lover's Lane Murders Ending this video off with a relatively tame one and another reason to stay out of the South, the Atlanta's Lover's Lane Murders were a series of mur unsolved shootings on three different couples in Atlanta, Georgia from January to March 1977. One attack ended in two fatalities, another one was one fatality, and the last one was not fatal. The gun, which was a 38 caliber pistol, was used in all three shootings, which pinpointed the attacks onto a single perpetrator. However, no suspect was ever apprehended in the over 40 years after the attack ended. At around 1 a.m. January 16, 1977, an out-of-control car drove full speed into an intersection and hit a street sign in Atlanta, Georgia. Police were called after the witness noticed the car's occupants weren't coming out. They searched inside and found 20-year-old LeBrian Lovett and 26-year-old Veronica Hill naked with gunshot wounds. Hill was in the back seat of the car under a coat. Lovett's wounds were in the head, stomach, right leg, and left arm. Hill's wounds were in the left leg and her abdomen. Both were still alive when found, and they were rushed to the hospital, where both died of their wounds. During the investigation, it was noted that the couple were seen heading towards Adams Park, a notorious hangout spot for couples to be involved in sexual intercourse. Here's a hot take. Car sex is nasty. Don't do it, because car sex is just gross. I would never do that in my car. It's fucking vile. Goddamn. Based on this news, it was determined that the two had been involved in sexual intercourse Jesus Christ, Wikipedia author, just say sex. They were fucking at Adam's Park when an unknown individual walked up, had some rage about that, and fired through the front window screen of the car. Lovett attempted to drive for help, but a bullet in the fucking head really doesn't help with your driving capability. The bullets were tested, and it was determined the gun used by the killer was a 38 caliber. At around 2 a.m. on February 12, 1977, 18-year-old Dennis Langston and 17-year-old Dealtira Tatum were having sex. There you go. That's how you say it. They were having sex. Jesus. They were having sex in a car parked in West Manor Park. Also degenerate shit. And then the same unknown individual approached and decided he was going to take things a little bit too far in getting them to stop the nasty car sex. Because he approached the passenger window and fired six shots. One of the bullets hit Dennis and another hit Detira. Both teens were still alive but seriously injured, and they were rushed to the hospital. Dennis and Detira would later make a full recovery. The teens said they got a quick look at the shooter but were only able to identify it as a black tall male. The bullets of the perpetrator f were tested and it was determined that it came from the same gun that killed LeBrian Lovett and Veronica Hill a month earlier, a 38 caliber. On March 12, 1977, 20-year-old Diane Collins was with her fiancé in Adams Park. They were fucking. They had seen a movie earlier that evening and were closing out their date there with some hot, juicy, disgusting car sex. The couple did not see the gunman as they were having sex, and he drew near to their vehicle and then shot six rounds into the passenger side window, killing Collins. Her fiancé was wounded in the head but survived. After the attack, he managed to drive the car to his home, where he phoned for an ambulance. It wasn't until late March when the police revealed to the public that the three shootings were linked, something that anyone could have figured out on their own. The same gun was used in all three, something that we couldn't have figured out on our own. And that the modus operandi was the same, something that's kind of visible on its own. During the investigation, investigators noticed a pattern on the dates of the shootings. They theorized the killer was following a three-week schedule, as the second shooting occurred 26 days after the first shooting, and the third shooting occurred 28 days after the second one. They thought that if the killer was following the three-week schedule, then he would strike again between the 6th or 8th of April. 
Between those days, undercover cops scoped out Adams Park and West Manor Park, waiting for the killer to strike. I wonder how far into character they got and whether or not they pretended to fuck. The first day turned up nothing, which wasn't surprising as the three-week schedule theory was only speculation. However, the killer never appeared on either the 7th or the 8th. In fact, the killer never struck again. Nevertheless, the police still investigated the murders, it's kind of their fucking job, until the investigation came to a halt when the Atlanta child murders, which I discussed all the way back in episode 2, began. And they started spending more time focusing on that, and in 1980s, the investigators said the investigation into the Lover's Lane shootings had come to a dead end. No new suspects had been found, and in the next 40 years, the case would sit cold where it is to this day. And that does it for today's episode, and my need to sit behind a computer at 1.30 in the morning. So if you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. If you're new here and you made it this far, go ahead and just subscribe. It's completely free and it helps me pursue my dreams. I hope you all have a wonderful time and would again like to thank you for watching. Make sure to give thanks to my editor for putting this together at 1.30 a.m. the Monday that it's being released. And until next time, memento mori.